right. Grab a book, grab a seat. Welcome, everyone, to the Spring Open House Special Evening Lecture. It's a great pleasure to have with us this evening Eric Bunge and Mimi Wong to present the work of their practice and architects through the lens of their most recent publication, in their words, an anti-monograph, entitled Almost Building. Like the work that it presents, Almost Building is an absolutely beautiful, elegant, and rich visual manifesto for what a thoughtful and sophisticated architectural practice looks like today. Moving across scale from folded paper models to bent bamboo structures and from tectonic building envelopes to playful urban fields, as well as across program and typology from pavilion to library, housing, cultural center, pier, tower, the diversity, pleasure, and precision that transpires from the book's pages, whether photographs or drawings, exudes not of, an, not of an idealist approach to the work of the architect, but rather a poetics that results from the discipline of practice. The daily discipline of sustaining obsessive and consistent attention to, to discover every opportunity for design and carve every possible space for architecture. In many ways, what is at once surprising, but also self-evident for those of us who have followed the evolution of Mimi and Eric's prolific partnership, is that spanning the diversity of their work is an undeniable and sustained consistency of approach. This consistency is rendered clearest through the book's drawings. Architecture for an Architect is first and foremost made up of lines. The drawn lines whose careful modulation in width thickness, orientation, spacing, materiality, and scale can transform to become built surfaces and volumes, at times opaque and at others transparent, at times filtering and at others reflecting, in a delicate yet purposeful articulation and rede redefinition of given relationships, whether between inside and outside, between various programs, or between old and new. Lines are what become boundaries in architecture, of course, but for an architect, they can also form what they have termed armatures, a sense that one can design and build just enough architecture to enable a scaffolding for architecture and life to flourish together and complete one another. As if reg registering with realism and humility the uncertainty of the times we live in as architects, but also as citizens of the world, almost building presents us with the work with work that is anything but uncertain. Rather, the book and the practice inspire us to consider a way forward for architects and for architecture in the pursuit of meaningful work through the careful and systematic reinvention of the discipline and the everyday together. In our time of distracted minds and seemingly collective attention deficit disorder, this level of attention is not only admirable, it is almost radical and has already resulted in an architect's seemingly discreet, yet confident, beautiful, and uniquely precise body of work whose impact continues to grow element after element, almost building after almost building. And with every project, there is a commitment to contributing beyond itself to the context, cultural, social, and environmental that it serves and shapes. This impact that is at once felt within the field, but more importantly, maybe even uh, beyond, has uh, of course been the recognition uh, of, th you know, through many, too many awards to list tonight. Just anecdotally, I have counted 25 in the last three years. But tonight we're mostly here, delighted to have both Mimi and Eric, cherished longtime GSAP faculty members who have inspired already so many students here at the school speak about their own work. Please join me in welcoming and architects Mimi Wong and Eric Bunge. Thank you, Mal, for the um, insightful and generous introduction, as always. Um, thank you so much for our uh, staff being here. Um, we're really happy to see you. Uh, former students, uh, future students, and of course our dear colleagues, um, we're really uh, happy that you're here. For us, this room is a kind of multi-layered uh, with many mem memories of conversations, and this is what we love about uh, being here at GSAP, is this incredible optimistic conversation that we continue to have. 
Thank you, Mal, for the honor of sharing our work with the people, the colleagues and students that galvanize us every day. Buildings and Almost Buildings is about questions that we've been asking for a long time. It just took us a while to put it down on paper. Um, questions about the objective aspects of architecture and its subjective experience. After we finished Canopy at MoMA PS1, we'd come and hang out like flies on the wall, anonymous spectators of the activity around us. Canopy was conceived as a framework for microclimates and social exchanges, but without hard boundaries or overt functions. We thought of it and our other early installations as almost buildings, buildings that invite transformation and interpretation by others, by the users and the misusers whom we began to call the inebriated who tried to climb it like a jungle gym or the ones who decided to decorate it with toilet paper or the ones who sent us this unsolicited <laughs> photo, the users and misusers, as we began to call them, um, who had appropriated the installation as their own. At the end of the summer, we sold the bamboo to the artist Matthew Barney, who used it as scaffolding in his upcoming movie. At the time, we were just trying to recoup the massive debt of building canopy, but in hindsight, we love the fact that it transformed from one kind of armature to another. So is architecture necessarily complete? Or is it a state of indeterminacy that incites us to engage with it? Whereas we made our early installations as building-like as possible, we are now trying to embody the attributes of the almost building in our more permanent work. Could they remain incomplete and embrace ambiguity in positive ways? At what point is architecture complete? It's a question that's been uh, evolving alongside philosophical and scientific discourses, of course, for a long time, and maybe one that couldn't have been asked about 100 years ago. Um, but we ask it through three frameworks, armatures, uh, boundaries, and zones. So at its most reduced, architecture is often represented as an armature, um, from Logier's 18th century depiction of the primitive hut, which you know, probably competes with cave and nest as the origin of architecture. 250 years later, uh, of course, the Corbusier's domino, uh, X-ray of constructive uh, potential of architecture. We see these as almost buildings in the most uh, basic sense, a sort of midway point between uh, something else and the building. So in fact, the, the fact that it's missing something, uh, that these are missing something is super exciting to, to us. Um, and because for us, they're, they're armatures that are capable of endless reformulation. But we're interested in both the uh, social aspects as well as the formal aspects of the armature. Um, how the armature could be awaiting its own uh, enactment of its potential, but also how it might delay uh, its form, an uncertain, potentially informal or open-ended form. So uh, two years ago, um, <clears throat> we had the opportunity to uh, enter a competition as a finalist with James Corner Field Operations for uh, Detroit River Yards. And it made us think about how uh, in the 1960s, the armature was kind of promoted to megastructure, uh, allowing architects from uh, you know, Archizoom to Archizoom Super Studio and the Metabolist and so on, an easy expansion from uh, building to city. Um, but we're more interested in the armature at a sort of finite scale of buildings where field and surfaces meet, um, at least usually, because I think in this case we kind of overdid it. This is a 2,000 foot long armature we somehow thought was a good idea. Um, but we, we explained in the, to the jury that, you know, it could be built over time. Uh, it would never really be complete. They might have missed this nuance, I think. Um, but so for us, open, arm, open Porch, as we called it, was an armature that could help uh, further the city of Detroit's um, ambition to reclaim empty space and turn it into a, a public realm. So we imagined it as a kind of a threshold or a catalyst that could uh, introduce intensity in a city that was lacking density. Um, so after search, searching for a lot of formal variation in the armature, we kind of uh, concluded that we didn't need to differentiate either its form or its use, um, because this would happen sort of automatically. Uh, as people would appropriate the length of this armature. And we quite like the tension between this diversity and the kind of um, tension that it might have with you know, a sort of a legible finite form. So as a framework with a, a made of glue lamp timber and steel, it basically uh, distributes infrastructure, whether it's electricity or shading or rain cover, armatures for plants, places to hang, uh, you know, play, play equipment and so on, and also gathers together a few of small buildings underneath it. Um, so given the progress of the city's uh, ongoing transformation of, uh, you know, almost a renaissance of Detroit, we, we felt that a simple armature could be completed, you know, over time. 
and it, it appears intimate in some places, um, endless in others. Uh, in other words, a work uh, uh, perpetually in progress. So after losing that competition, um, a year later, we had an opportunity to build a, a real armature. This is a project that starts construction in the fall. Um, it's the Jones Beach Energy and Nature Center, a long sim single story building that will act as a sort of armature uh, for exhibitions and education about a very interesting correlation between nature and energy. So the exhibitions will highlight uh, both positive and negative connections between these two fields. Um, it's in a very beautiful place, um, a legacy of Robert Moses in the 1920s. This uh, barrier island on the Atlantic, just an hour drive away, was created by a lot of dredging and uh, landfill, if you will. Um, and it's a beautiful site with the exception of this parking that you see. In two weeks, we're going to start demolishing two thirds of it and turning that rubble into dunes, uh, pathways, and uh, also to help us elevate this building above the floodplain. This is one of the better legacies of Robert Mogus, Moses, I think, less controversial. He left us with a lot of, uh, I guess, really good public space on the, on the beaches. Um, just due west of this is our site. It's kind of very different from, from that legacy. It's a very natural place. If you go there, you can see a lot of migrating birds, um, dune grasses. It's a really beautiful kind of pristine place. Um, so we're replacing it with a one-story building um, that's 320 feet long, elevated above the floodplain. And our goals uh, here are to create an immersion with nature, which is why we're removing all that concrete. Um, and, but a lot of constraints we had to build just north of the Seahaw line, that dashed line you see, that's the coastal erosional hazard area line. We also reused all the piles from an existing SOM 1960s bathhouse that we're uh, demolishing, so dilapidated and extending. And then, of course, we wanted to create a great viewing sort of deck to the beach. Um, the, the project's organized around a series of volumes that contain all the services and mechanical and produce a kind of very continuous gallery that will then uh, tell the story of, of energy, nature, and those interesting correlations. Um, inside this building, which is uh, framed in timber, uh, you will learn about smart grids, uh, renewable energy, um, the ecosystem, but also what are the connections between, between those fields. The building itself will be a teaching instrument. It'll be a net zero building with 300 uh, solar panels. Um, it's partly funded by New York State Parks, and um, the governor's office, as well as the local energy provider. So along its uh, length, this armature that surrounds the building will become a kind of place for teaching, for outdoor uh, uses. In fact, we have no idea what it's going to be used for, which is the whole point. Uh, but we're providing the amenities for, for, for that to happen, a shaded area, um, electricity, and basic connection to, you know, to the environment. We've thought of it as a chalet for all, kind of like a large Hamptons house, but for the general public, basically. <laughs> and as we've been exploring a range of possibilities for the armature, oscillating between its disappearance and its clear expression, we've been asking similar questions at the boundaries of our work. Can the boundary be complete and incomplete in different places, or in different times, or in different ways? Full confession, we like making holes, cutting them out of buildings, creating erasures, they range from the shallow to the deep to confound the relationship between the buildings, or to confound the limits between buildings and their context. It's also an act of sneakily transferring privately owned space to the public, or bringing that public domain and the macro scale of the city into our work. So for us, the almost building is variably connected to the environment. We see these limits not as a single thickness, but as multiple layers and depths, which brings into question, where does the building begin or end? So we had an opportunity to make a few holes in this project. Um, before uh, Carbon Mini uh, approached us to transform this 22,000 square foot warehouse in Greenpoint into a design center, um, we asked the question, well, will there be any cars? And we we're so relieved to find out there are no cars. It's a, just a design center. But as, uh, at that time, they had not yet settled on this name, ADO, which stands for Amalgamated Des uh, Drawing Office. That's the office that produced the first mini. And it's interesting to see how their changes in names uh, kind of reflected their changing agenda as they produced this new uh, institution. So at one point, they called it Grassroots Box, which, and the idea was to engage all the local design and fabrication community. Um, then they call it Free Space, a name that we proposed as a sort of idea about continuous ur urban interior. And then finally settled on um, ADO. 
So it's in Greenpoint, you can go there. There's a restaurant, a design center, you can actually work for free, it's like a free office, uh, free Wi-Fi, there's a little uh, design shop. But there's also an accelerator that's producing ideas about improving uh, urban life. Um, but for us, we, we, we were thinking about the conversations we were gonna have with this building, a very opaque building, uh, 24,000 square feet. Um, and and we, led, we, we kind of gravitated towards ambiguous transformations rather than uh, legible ones. Um, so we made many new openings, um, and we used the salvage graffiti-covered bricks uh, to patch them up again, and we were very excited about this. We, we called it reconstituted graffiti, and then the graffiti artists came back and they tagged it. And so at first we were upset, but then we realized if we really believe in appropriation, uh, we should be excited. And so actually we were kind of amused by this, this uh, multiple layers. But, but this ethos of kind of patching and re remixing the context, remixing uh, aspects of the 12 foot wide garage doors throughout Greenpoint, uh, just letting it be messy, not patching electrical uh, you know, uh, lines that we'd, we put into the slab, things like that, really inspired us to create a kind of destabilizing place that is really multi-layered and, and, and just quite rough. But the, the largest hole we made was this, uh, what we call the cut, uh, where we removed basically a triangular section of the building and rebuilt it back in the same brick, um, kind of uh, thinking that maybe, maybe somebody might think it had always um, uh, been here. It's probably unlikely. But this idea of the remix uh, extended to the programmatic goals that uh, our client had, which was to say that these uh, functions, the restaurant on your, on your left, and then this sort of free space, this river of space in the middle, that's kind of a, an exhibition space a lot of the time, as well as a workspace, would just flow from one to the other. Uh, basically a nightmare when approaching the Department of Buildings because they don't understand anything that is you know, not in a, in, like in, in a box, <laughs> right? But one of the nicest descriptions we heard uh, from somebody, I forget who it is now, was that it's kind of like a museum without galleries. It's a bit pompous maybe, but we, we like this idea that it kind of has all the armatures of the museum. We were interested in confounding the physical boundaries as well as the cultural, social, starting with that cut on the exterior and then extending it as a deep construct through the space. So this living drawing is trying to show how that free space in the middle is constantly reconfigured, um, going from event space to free co-working space. People don't work for free, they're working. No, the... they work, uh, they don't have to pay. <laughs> free co-working space. Um, 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 to, uh, to hosting uh, um, a rotating exhibitions from the design community. Um, and so we are cutting through the walls that we need to separate use um, that allows us to bleed those programs um, between, um, from, from each other into that free space. And um, hovering over that free space is a very large skylight that we call a periscope, which <coughs> brings a much larger context of the city into the space. Um, in this case, it reflects Midtown Manhattan and downtown Brooklyn, not downtown Brooklyn, Williamsburg, into one plane. It's for us a way of remixing the context, creating this new surreal context um, and bringing it into the space. And so as the contents of the space below is changing through the rotating exhibitions, so does the light and the color of the light and, and, and how that illuminates the space. We really imagined the, uh, um, the project as an armature, an open invitation to engage with it. Um, and so we proposed in the last bay that they didn't need all this space, just rip the roof off. Um, to allow for things like this to happen. This is an installation by Assemble Collective from London who proposed a new kind of factory, making the tiles in the workshop um, further into the space and then cladding this uh, um, structure. Or this installation by United Visual Artists, which was fantastic because it really reframed how we interpreted the space ourselves. And so it's interesting to think about how our urban, how our city zoning often produces silos of use. It made sense in the early 1900s, particularly for manufacturing uh, districts like this one, because of environmental concerns. But now, as the waterfront neighborhoods are opening up to new modes of production, we're interested in making these work cultures visible and participatory.
Further down the East River, we are renovating these two industrial warehouses as part of a campus for the garment industry. There are many pressures on our waterfronts. We need more public space. We also need more housing, and we need to increase density for housing. The two buildings that we're doing are these two buildings here. But we also need to keep manufacturing space in the city and to support the working class, largely immigrant class, that actually make things. And so this picture is from the turn of the century um, when Brooklyn was the fourth largest manufacturing center in the country and the Brooklyn Army, sorry, the Bush Terminal was this revolutionary and first of its kind intermodal shipping, warehousing, and manufacturing complex and the largest one in the States. The two buildings that we're doing, that we're renovating are there and here in this plan. So you can see in this site plan the way in which the ship, the shipping, the, the delivery of goods from ships and then transported to rails worked. They literally pass right through the buildings on these rails. But with the advent of air freight, the ships and the railways were abandoned and the pier buildings slowly disappeared in such a way that the old storehouses, these two that we're doing, all of a sudden now front the river, whereas they didn't before. This is an opportunity for us to reconnect in new ways to the, to the river. It's part of a larger mayoral initiative called Made in New York that is about keeping manufacturing, keeping things made in New York, and providing for spaces for the garment industry who typically work in extremely insulated environments to open up their environments in different ways. So it's interesting to look at the original buildings because they were essentially a building of doors, not windows, doors, that allowed the goods to come in and out straight from the exterior facade through these pulleys and gangways. And so we are cutting into the buildings. Um, from then, in, I'm sorry, from then to now, the um, multiple transformation of the building is really present at the locus of the facade. There are layers of transformation. At one point, these cuts were introduced, the concrete spandrels were introduced, and so this is the existing condition that we're working with. We are cutting, opening up the building, and connecting or replacing the rails that used to bring the goods from the water to the street with this interior street that now connects the city side, which is this view, to the water side on the other side. And in this way, we are acknowledging that there are multiple histories. There are overlapping histories, not just one history. And we are adding to these histories, adding layers to the intervention, um, I'm sorry, adding layers of intervention in a way that the old, or the, rather the new, doesn't stand apart from the old, but remixes it in unfamiliar ways. At what thickness uh, does a boundary become a zone? And if we progressively erase this zone, at what point does the building read as incomplete? This question, of course, is relative, and it will depend on your culture and the climate in which you live. Um, but within this framework, we're really interested in some historical examples, including Le Corbusier's Villa Baiseau from 1928, the second scheme, the built one, which, uh, in which each floor plate uh, is ringed by a, a perimeter of exterior spaces. These are all stacked, and, and they're residual. But what if they would be more like Louis Kahn's uh, fascination with uh, castles, in this case, the Kamlongan Castle? which a series of geometrically described voids would be considered um, exterior. So if we move from the perimeter to the center of a building, uh, along the way, let's say from a veranda to a light well to the, the courtyard, um, one can consider this a kind of a spectrum of voids that could also be uh, considered in section. If we survey from the elevated ground plane of the modernist uh, building to a loggia to um, a covered roof, um, in either case, we're, we're really interested in the ambiguous possibilities in between. <clears throat> and the, the capacity for these sort of incomplete voids to inform the building's spatial structure, which we think of as a neutral term that sidesteps issues of type. So in um, Auburn, in Auburn, New York, um, we've recently finished a, a project that, again, had a name change. It's now the New York State Equal Rights Heritage Center. Um, but it started with really humble goals. Uh, the RFP asked us to design a, um, a visitor center we probably wouldn't have gotten the project had it been announced like this. Everyone would have been after this. But it's in a really interesting uh, site in the, uh, the Finger Lakes district of uh, upstate New York, a, um, a, a city uh, whose moniker is H History's hometown. Um, 
that was at the crossroads of progressive ideas in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, and this is the home of Harriet Tubman. She spent the last 50 years of her life. And for those of you who don't know, she's a national hero who is the uh, operator of the Underground Railroad. And directly adjacent to our site, another very important figure in the struggle for equal rights is that William Seward, who is the governor of New York and um, secretary of state to Abraham Lincoln. And his uh, house, which is this red dot, is directly adjacent to our site. It's now a museum. Um, and so in, we've been working, in a sense, in um, a two, sort of two historical contexts. The one is the built historical context. Um, so, which is really at the hinge point, if you will, right between the historical uh, part of the town and the downtown. And the other one is the pro social context, the progressive historical context. And what was fascinating to us was that the, the, our client and the, the town, the people of the town, had a very uh, conservative attitude about the first, the built one, and a very progressive attitude about the social context. So that was quite a challenge to, to marry the two. And so the, as the social context of the project is really an exhibition that celebrates a struggle for equal rights, um, mainly focusing on abolition of slavery, women's suffrage, and LGBTQ rights. And it's an effort, uh, initiative that comes from our governor, and um, it's really a, kind of a portal, if you will, to visit all the sites throughout New York State that are connected to these, to these issues. So it's a, uh, as a one-story building in this site, it was quite challenging to think about how to build in a, next to buildings that are comparatively taller. Um, but yet, uh, our project is bigger in footprint th than them. So we looked at ways to uh, kind of articulate the form, and we kind of understood that many of the houses in the region are really comprised of volumes or elements. And it, in a way, this is how we articulated to the to the city how we would build this community building, you know, within that context of, of, of houses. So the project is uh, comprised of four uh, volumes that, that hinge together and open up views to the context. Um, and uh, that are con constructed around uh, two cores, uh, allowing for a, uh, a visit that is kind of in the, in the figure eight. Um, this, this organization really places you as a visitor always on the perimeter, looking out to the context. Um, and so we wanted that connection to be very, very kind of direct, very, you know, very immediate. Now the project happened super quickly, uh, 19 months from concept design to ribbon cutting. Um, and we also were kind of, you know, overseeing the site design, the exhibition design. We became part of the curatorial team because there wasn't a curator. And so actually it forced us to think very comprehensively or cohesively across these different disciplines. Um, how can a small building like this uh, really kind of live up to its sort of large uh, social and exhibition goals? So our first instinct was to think of the context as content. So the building kind of uh, engages the existing context through very large openings and of course through these what we call cuts, again, borrowing from our own uh, ADO, uh, views the structure, very direct connections to, to the environment. So this is just a screenshot that then very few months later became a reality um, where the Seward House Museum in this case really kind of enters into the building through this kind of very incomplete zone. Um, we also wanted the project to uh, be very monolithic and elemental in its construction, kind of a viewing device. So we used reinforced concrete uh, for the interior finish as well. It actually ended up being faster. We had less issues to deal with, less beams and so on. But we also wanted it to be very kind of uh, primitive. So it's a brick-clad building with concrete throughout the floor and uh, glue lamp timber uh, beams and structural wood decking. So very simple materials. Now the exhibition uh, sequence is really uh, figure eight. Um, and I'll take it very quickly through uh, the different elements that we co-designed with MTWTF. Um, and the funny thing is the first one has been immediately appropriated by the town who have written on the chalk. The idea was to give them a map in chalkboard so they can always update it in a, in a low-tech way. Um, so from the foyer, you're already, already kind of introduced to the exterior. And then you make a choice. You can turn left. Um, see one of our Finger Lake loungers. It's uh, based on the bathymetry of the, the Finger Lakes. You can sit there. Uh, look at this video content that shows you uh, dynamic maps explaining the, the connection between the, the region and his, uh, equal rights. Or sit at the, you can sit at the sound booth where you hear um, recorded speeches, excerpts from them, but spoken in contemporary voices so you understand that the struggle for uh, equal rights continues today. Or you can look at these um, uh, fantastic posters that kind of uh, celebrate through color-coded uh, uh, fabric which conceals the... Um, acoustic uh, absorptive material behind, all of the kind of characters that are um, part of the story. Or you can sit at the social justice table where you see a uh, rotating video of uh, legislative milestones or continue to look outside. So this hinging of interior and exterior space, interpenetration of volume and solid, is something that we're quite interested in that kind of destabilizes your, your perception of the very small building. Um, 
in, in, in this way. Um, so it's uh, interesting that as we, um, this is the day of the opening, uh, as the uh, controversy surrounding the, uh, the loss of their municipal parking lot uh, started to fade, um, people in Auburn have started to uh, warm up to the building. In fact, now it's kind of their living room, um, their, their social space. Um, and f all these crazy things happened, but this was the opening, and I, I would say the kind of the best moment uh, f for us was uh, Pauline Copes Johnson, who's the great grandniece of uh, Harriet Tubman, is there uh, next to our Lieutenant Governor, Kathy Hoshul, ca cutting the ribbon. Um, I asked her, um, you know, Ms. Copes Johnson, uh, how do you like the project? How do you like the building? And she said, better than I expected. And so <laughs> I didn't see that coming, but it, it really uplifted us. And I think, <laughs> I don't know what to expect, but dur during these dark, <laughs> During these, uh, frankly, dark times as a country, we've, we've, we've found some consolation in these projects that have a social agenda. So we explored the idea of the incomplete zone in plan and section in response to climate and culture in the next two projects. One begat the other. Villa Villa is part of a project that um, um, Ai Weiwei curated. There are many GSAP faculty involved. We were all stuck in the same holiday in eating bok choy for four days, um, designing 10,000 square foot villas. Ordus is in Inner Mongolia. Um, the government was trying to develop this area as a new energy sector for the country. Um, two, two intuitions shaped our response. The first is the extreme desert climate. It is extremely cold in the winter and extremely hot in the summer, and it makes outdoor living kind of unfeasible. The second is maybe because we were living in a 370 square foot apartment in the East Village. Who needs 10,000 square feet? So we thought we would wrap an inner house that is smaller with an outer house, where the inner house is the house that you actually need. Um, and it is fully conditioned, heated, cooled, has better materials, et cetera. The outer house is much more rough. It's not really heated or cooled. It's passively heated and cooled and um, has only top light. And so it's an idea of um, structuring the organization and morphology of the project around a thermal logic to reduce the energy that you consume and spend. Um, which we try to encapsulate in this thermal model where you can see the blue is the extreme cold, the green is somewhere in between, and the warm spots are the inner house. Um, in terms of the floor plan levels, we try to create three radically different floor plans that basically are all spanning from the perimeter to the same four columns. The ground floor, each spoke opens to the exterior. The second floor is living in a donut in the round, and the fourth floor, the four bedrooms have different orientations. It's an idea that living expands and contracts. It contracts in the extreme climate and it expands into the outer house during um, the, the better uh, months. Um, we never built it, but it's almost built in our minds, which explains the aesthetic of these images, this kind of abandoned construction site. Um, the project was actually canceled the client fell out of favor with the government and exiled himself to London, but we were still thinking about this idea of a building within a building, and so we tried it again for a library in Shanghai, this time at a million square feet, um, which is big. And <laughs> we didn't know how to deal with that scale at first. Um, our intuition was, how do we make it feel intimate? How do we create intimate um, uh, spaces for reflection and study, um, but also balancing the institutional scale at the same time. The site in Shanghai is right next to Century Park, which is basically their central park. It's a well-loved park. Um, and so our intuition was to shove it in the corners so that we could open and maximize the open space and create a very immersive uh, park environment outside of the building, but also from within the building. Um, we took cues from China's oldest library, the Tianyege, where the living, or, or so, sorry, the reading room is very connected to the outdoor environment, and the books are above to protect it from rot and mildew, et cetera. And so we took that pairing, call it a sandwich of floors, and basically multiplied it, kind of like the binary code of the project. Multiplied it um, vertically through the, the project. Um, so 
Each floor plate is a different figure in plan. And as they are stacked, the in-between space creates this very nebulous space in between and allows us to connect, interconnect these different datums that for us, because there's pairs of floors, would maybe make the building feel a little bit smaller. And so you can see in, in these plans how the different configuration of the floor, basically the superimposition of that creates that multiple height void at the perimeter and creates this vertically continuous library. In the middle are the cores, that's the fast route through the library. Along the edges are slower routes that basically hopscotch between open floor and open floor, and you can see it on this section where that slow route takes you around the um, cylinder in between the library and these captured garden environments that are in the thickened facade. This is one of them, um, connecting the ground floor to the open, I mean the ground floor to the third, bypassing the second, which is one of the densely packed floors, which is where all the books are. And so it goes until you reach the top, which is the most quiet space for study. We were really fascinated that not only was paper introduced in China, but also the printing block, and those were terracotta. And so the terracotta creates a screen. That's what you look through. The unfinished side, the warm side, faces in the interior of the library. And the glazed side, which is iridescent, faces the exterior. We thought we won, but then we found out that we didn't actually win anything. We won the ideas competition, but not the actual competition to build. And so we didn't really win anything. So we built a model which is what we do when we lose competitions. We build the model of the project, and they live with us in the office as constant reminders to try it again. Almost a project. It's almost. Um, so if the incomplete is about the physical limits of the buildings of our work, ambiguity is about the questioning, the singularity of the experience of the projects. If you've been to the Storm King Art Center, you might have seen this piece by Alison Schatz called Mirror Fence, or you might have missed it because it tends to appear and disappear. In form, it's a doppelganger of a picket fence, but this fence, rather than divide space, dissolves into a landscape of light and weather and seasons. We are obsessed with similar ideas. How can we register the impermanent contexts of our work? How can we fold the perception of a building into its surrounding, collapsing far and near, object with field. We're of course drawing from a much longer discourse about ambiguity, from Emson to Venturi to Colin Rowe. Our focus has partly been to convey the material and temporal ambiguity, to remix contexts and to destabilize perception. So the almost building is intentionally vulnerable to contrasting and conflicting interpretation and resists a stable identity. If you visit Chicago as a tourist, you might have visited this place. It's Navy Pier. It's the second most um, popular tourist destination in the state of Illinois. But if you live there as a Chicagoan, you definitely have never, you never go here unless you have visitors from out of town because it is a tourist trap. The American waterfront has gone through two phases of redevelopment since the 80s. The first turned the waterfront into these carnivalesque marketplaces which is the pier that we inherited. It was actually one of Burnham's five piers, only one of them was built. Um, and this is the existing pier that we started to work with that had been so clogged with um, so many different kinds of structures, banners, commercialism, capitalism, that you couldn't actually see the city and you couldn't actually see the lake. And so really the main part of our work was to erase and to declutter and to reconnect the structures and the experience of the pier back to the lake. So all of the structures that we did from the small to the large in some way reframe, re-engage, and reflect the city and the lake, starting with the lake pavilion, which started with this potentially dumb, simple idea of can we take a slice of the lake and float it above the pier? 
um, the lake freezes in the winter, so it becomes a complete, you know, just a, a, a solid um, sheet of glass. And in the winter, the sky is extremely gray. And then it becomes this Caribbean blue in the summer. So the lake pavilions are constantly changing as you um, uh, um, visit the pier throughout the seasons. You could think of it as one volume that's hewn, where the void is carved out, or you could think of it as two um, kiosks that is covered by a reflective surface that is actually polished aluminum that reflects the lake from one side and the activity of the pier on the other and recombines it in this way that is always different no matter where you are, or no, ma no matter the time of day. Um, it's very, very popular with the flies um, because the reflection of the light and the illumination from the kiosk attract them. So in the summer, it's completely covered with spiders who feast on the flies. <laughs> but I guess if we are really opening our structures to appropriation, that includes spiders. And spider poop is now on our list of things to watch out for. Um, to mark the beginning of the pier, and to restitch it back into the city is what we call the information tower. Um, if you stand in a certain position and squint your eyes, you might think it, that it's a skyscraper that leapt across the, um, the highway onto the pier, but it's actually only 45 feet tall. It's intentionally playing with the proportion and the scale of the skyscraper and borrowing it. And it borrows a concept about borrowing, which is shake in Japanese which um, means to borrow a distant scenery and incorporate it into the garden. And it's re really very much a part of um, Japanese and Chinese garden design. So the info tower reflects, depending on your vantage point, the brick pier buildings or the sky or the, sky, the, or the fireworks that are shot off during the summer. It appears and disappears and it registers the moon cycle. So when there's a new moon, the lights inside are more dim, and when it's the full moon, the, bright, the lights inside brighten. It's Not gonna do that. A project on the boards. So even if we uh, perceive uh, formal or temporal ambiguity in a sort of very visceral, intuitive way, it's uh, culturally inflected to some level. And this becomes more the case when we're confronted with a, a hybrid. Um, so is the Ponte Vecchio a bridge? A, you know, is it a building? Is it a fragment of a city? Um, you know, it started as a bridge, um, and it, but evolved really to this sort of typologically ambiguous uh, condition. It's both and street and building. Um, we, love, we love thinking about this uh, question. If something occupies a gradient between something and something else, uh, you know, it's in this case, it's almost something else. Where, you know, so it's, it's very confusing, but we, we love this idea. And to paraphrase Rosalind Krauss, our position about architecture is to think about a spectrum between building and almost building and to find, find these places in between, which is what we think about as the almost building. Uh, we are fascinated with this indeterminacy and the variety of interpretations that, that emerge from this condition. Um, maybe the most simple uh, form of uh, typological ambiguity is building a sign. Um, so this is a project for the DOT. Um, it's very much a part of our infrastructure, our city's infrastructure. On this side is the maintenance facility for all of DOT's vehicles, and on this side is one of the five asphalt plants that supply asphalt to um, the city. Um, we obviously played with signage, with um, road signage in particular. Um, so, you know, if you are a truck driver coming to refuel here, you will know unambiguously which direction you need to travel that way. Um, or, or this building actually houses electrical transformers. The squiggle in the elevation is the electrical diagram for stepping up power from low voltage to high voltage. So the building simply does what it advertises. 
So when we were invited to uh, design an art installation in Taiwan, we uh, told the client that we're not artists, and we asked them, can we uh, produce something useful? So they said, sure, what do you want to do? And so we said, well, how about you know, a place for people to gather? And they said, okay. So, so we designed this uh, pavilion for uh, the local, local people, the Amis, as a kind of a performance space. It's in a very beautiful part of uh, eastern Taiwan called Hualien. Um, and the context was a kind of a new park that was celebrating the Taiwanese government's low carbon footprint. So we thought that was, that was worth celebrating. Um, and, and we wanted to create a pavilion that had m multiple uh, sides, a kind of polycentric pavilion that reflected the fact that there are many different tribes of the local uh, indigenous Amis people there who all told their stories in, in different ways. So we created uh, 11 band shells, as it were, with a uh, curved uh, green bamboo uh, technique we had developed in our canopy that Mimi showed you um, many years before. And a circular uh, stage where we thought with this void in the middle, and a, and a ring, and no hierarchy, uh, all kinds of uh, things might, might happen. We built this with uh, the local uh, Amis people, and it was great to see them just take their, the bamboo from the car to the site and, and, you know, and build this very quickly. Um, so these band shells uh, produce this kind of strange condition where it really it's a choice uh, on the part of the performer or the director to, as to how this is configured. And it was exciting to see how ultimately performer an audience really would occupy the same space. Maybe not a perfect seat, but uh, you know, a choice in, in terms of how this would unfold. And at a slightly larger scale, um, the, the largest structure that we did on um, the Chicago Navy Pier is this wave wall, which is somewhere between a stair and a landscape. Um, we, um, we were responding to a very functional aspect of the brief, which was please connect the two dock levels. Um, so we propose this wall that inflex out to become an overlook over the lake and inflex in to become a stair. And the seeming continuity of the form um, is actually made up of lots of um, pieces and the um, louvers themselves are actually cassettes that were prefabricated in a shop and are brought to site and hung onto the armature. Our contractor was very grumpy when he was building this. He called it the Swiss watch of stairs, which we thought was a compliment. <laughs> and so this, um, the, the typological ambiguity that we're playing with, stair, landscape, stage, etc., is about providing these spaces that can be um, for, for use, for spectators, for audiences, um, and it's constantly changing. It's a social gathering space of the pier that reconnects the space of the pier back to the lake and to the city. In the last two projects, we're asking what happens when the almost building is considered at the scale of the city. Soria Imata's linear city from 1882 proposed to blur the distinction between industry, agriculture, and daily life. It was meant to be no more than 500 meters wide. That's about two long city blocks. And it would have extended for however long humanity required. Linear City influenced the Soviet disturbanist and the Japanese metabolist movement. And we are in turn inspired by their typologically ambiguous combination of streets and buildings. But these mega building as infrastructure projects delineate a very legible strip that sets them apart from their context, leaving the existing ground plane of the city or country untouched. We are interested, for this exhibition, Manhattanisms, we were interested in engaging a more ambiguously broad territory. Storefront for Art and Architecture asked 40 architects, many GSAP faculty, to speculate on new urban forms of Manhattan that might arise from our current sharing economy. So Key Party extrapolates on this culture of sharing where life has been dispersed and atomized across the block. But we're also projecting its corollary, a retreat from all the sharing into small private spaces. So we're imagining that the city blocks could be dispersed, overlapping, um, sorry, we imagine that the city blocks could be cut up where, and, and dispersed, where you, leave be, where you live between the larger shared public buildings and the mini towers that provide an escape from civic life. Our logic was that if we can take advantage of the efficiencies of sharing, maybe we can expand, expand the public realm of the ground plane. It's a utopian or dystopian, depending on how you feel about sharing, <laughs> hypothetical Manhattan as a field-like armature of amenities. 
So in 2012, we had an opportunity to contribute to the evolution of the housing uh, types, or at least discourse in the city. Um, as Mimi mentioned, we used to live in a very small apartment, so we had to first overcome our own uh, uh, initial concerns about designing very small units, but we did uh, realize that it's a conversation that needs to be had and a necessary step to increase density and at least begin to address equity and affordability. So Carmel Place was the first uh, prize in this um, competition held by the Bloomberg administrations uh, at the time uh, called Adapt NYC. <clears throat> and um, it's uh, located in Kipps Bay on 27th Street and 1st Avenue. It's still there, last time we checked. <laughs> um, and it emerges from a, a long lineage of uh, histories and stories and discussions about uh, housing in New York City. At the turn of the 20th century, Jacob Rees, the photographer, uh, exposed the uh, of urban plight of the, the plight of the urban poor, which galvanized a lot of legislation, improving uh, living conditions, uh, light and air, uh, et cetera, were introduced. Um, since then, the average unit size in the country has uh, steadily increased from 1940 at about 1,000 square feet till uh, 2007 at about 2,500 square feet. It keeps on ebbing and flowing, but it's also uh, ebbing and flowing in the wrong direction at some level because it's going against the grain of uh, our, our household size. We no longer say families, we should say households, and these households are very diverse. In fact, 82% of them in, in, in New York City are not comprised of um, uh, nuclear families, but our housing stock is really uh, you know, based on the idea of a family. Um, the percent of single persons uh, living uh, nationwide, uh, alone nationwide, is, is, is very, very high. And this is old data. This is from five years ago, so uh, maybe more. It's, of course, a, a national, uh, uh, international issue as well. And probably we'll see this more and more in countries like the BRIC countries. So at what level is, um, you know, the idea of a unit, uh, at what level does it adapt to social change, uh, but also to the way we live and work? Um, so the competition was held in 2012 and is based on a uh, body of research um, by, uh, uh, by CHPC. Uh, we won it in 2013, uh, maybe partly on the basis of this image, which they probably thought was real. It was just a rendering of uh, our approach. Um, and uh, three years later, it, it stands there built. Um, the project is basically comprised of 55 rental apartments, 40% uh, of which are um, affordable, as they call it. Uh, designated to different levels of income, and 60% of them which are, are market rate. Um, there are standard apartments in every sense, in terms of the lease and so on. Um, but given the small size of the units, we, we try to uh, really expand on the public space. And I think that since we actually won a competition, our developers, uh, partners, had to really maintain this, this ratio, so it's actually quite generous for a building of this type. The ground floor, for instance, the lobby, we oversized it so that it's like an outdoor street, um, hypothetically, a Thanksgiving dinner with all 100 residents could, could happen, uh, and so on. And so we tried to disperse the public space where we could. Um, these units are all uh, single, uh, are studios, but within the, even though it's one type of, of unit, there, there's a kind of a large variety, partly uh, due to the site. And actually, this large variety created uh, a spectrum of different uh, possibilities for, for residents, which was kind of interesting, at least to the real estate people, but it, it was interesting in terms of the diversity of people who could live there. We built it as a series of 65 modules, uh, steel frame modules that are welded together, all sitting on top of a, a, a base, which we built in situ. So we had two sites. It was kind of confusing. Uh, which site are we going to today? Uh, so the factory, which was in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, no longer exists, um, where we built these modules uh, over a period of a few months. And then the, the real site, as it were, um, where these modules were then shipped across the Manhattan Bridge with police escort and stacked in a period of three and a half weeks, um, which makes everybody really excited, especially if you're a developer, but it really took a year and a half, uh, this, whole, this whole process. But it was exciting to see that moment and then to enter these apartments for the first time in, in place after having seen them many iterations in, 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 in the uh, factory. We introduced some very basic ideas, very tall ceilings, uh, huge uh, uh, sliding doors, that, uh, uh, windows, or, or sliding terrace doors that create like a feeling of a terrace, lots of storage. It's kind of the basics, but it really made it feel spacious, um, so much so that a New York Times reporter who spent uh, a night there, um, you know, in the end decided it was really spacious and had all her friends over. She could have cooked, but she actually ordered Chinese takeout. Um, but this is to demonstrate that you could, you could live <laughs> in, this, in this apartment. Um, so the project is kind of diminutive uh, next to its neighbors, but it, it, I guess it has a large uh, voice in the conversation about zoning and lifestyle and affordability. In fact, the zoning for quality and affordability was enacted a bit after that, and we had to testify uh, or speak to the, you know, um, 
to the to the authorities about about many many things. But it's interesting to think about how how it's now part of a larger set of infrastructural ideas, and that influenced our approach to the design. So we design it as four what we call micro towers, which are is a sneaky way to hide mechanical equipment and elevator, uh, and, uh, you know, mechanical rooms and and, and um, things like that into a single form that in a way like Hugh Ferris could just be basically adapted to varying zoning constraints. Um, we also modulated the color of the brick to suture it together uh, within this kind of modulated context, but also to give it a, um, a different experience, kind of a subtle experience as you walk around the building with many uh, sort of different perceptions. Um, we're interested in celebrating basically this very uh, thin dimension. So can we think of units beyond the four walls of a uh, dispersed home? Can we think of uh, building as a microcosm of the city skyline? Um, can we think of housing as infrastructure? And where does one build building begin and another one end? Are there intermediate condi conditions? So um, in our uh, living room or dining room, there's a, a s seven peas have invaded an Italian garden. This is the whimsical work of our uh, friend and artist uh, Nina Kachadurian as part of her uh, series called Seed Assignment. She makes these uh, on flight with things at hand, in this case, the in-flight magazine and, and the contents of her dinner. Um, but it's become our daily inspiration uh, because in our search for thinking about architecture that simultaneously occupies different realms. Um, it's also a metaphor for a practice, not just ours, but I think all of ours in a sense. Uh, practice is the airplane cabin, our intellectual work workspace, a space full of constraints, but mostly, mostly possibilities. Um, so in our book, uh, first events, copies of which I think were I'm not sure if there are any left, but you can order if you like. Um, we put forward an architecture that embraces the impermanence of things and their perceptions. While the notion of the incomplete um, really asks questions about the physical, or shall we say the objective limits of architecture, uh, ideas about ambiguity for us I invite questions about the perceived, or shall we say subjective aspects. So for us, the almost building is an act of resistance, an act of resistance to closure, and a constant reminder to remain open-ended. Thanks very much. Well, thank you for this kind of inspiring lecture. I think it's really, first of all, I know that the book is fresh off the press. Um, and uh, I know that you've been kind of working on it uh, for some time. And since, um, you know, today we've been talking about, you know, putting things together and assembling a kind of position through the making of portfolios, etc. Uh, I wanted to kind of expand a little bit on the on the making um, uh, of the book and how it sort of reflected back on your practice as a way to to read the read the work. Um, uh, it's you know it was very interesting for me when I um, saw it. It, it you know I, obviously this is intentional, but uh, uh, this you know this kind of line that cuts through um, from uh, the drawings to the projects and the way you use, uh, the way you've chosen to kind of redraw some of the work with this kind of striation, you know, these these lines, uh, suddenly I started to see that across all of the projects as a kind of thread um, in terms of this armature, this, this sense of, you know, from the bamboo, you know, um, uh, kind of the lines and the kind of grain uh, of, of of the bamboo to even what was interesting for me in the in the library is that you know while ordos is a sort of diagram of a stack let's say the library creates gaps between the the kind of solid and the void and and creates this kind of striation in, in section that then you overlay with you know the striation of the diagonals of the of the facade and that, you know there's kind of layering uh, that that happens or the the kind of vertical striation of Carmel um, and the and the kind of zigzag of the super graphic DOT little little structures and I, I had never read that clarity through the work that kind of layering um, only in fragments uh, I think and you know that was kind of very interesting uh, for for me when I you know when I saw when I saw the book and then that kind of gets layered then with I mean, of course, it, it does, physically, it does what it's supposed to do, which is kind of infrastructural um, sense of, of, of architecture, but also um, the sort of blurring of inside and outside, this kind of ambiguity. Uh, but then you layer the materiality, you know, this kind of, uh, whether it's uh, 
bamboo mirror reflection, you know, like that artwork that, that um, you've shown. Anyway, I, I thought it was very interesting uh, that the, the, you know, through the drawings is kind of a rereading, through the, through the ways in which you've shown, you know, you've chosen to redraw the projects, there is now a very uh, kind of new clarity as, the, as to the work itself, or at least some of the, of course, it's every, every project is different, but there is a sort of re refraction or reflection that, that happens. And I wanted to maybe uh, hear you talk about, um, only because, of, of course, I, you know, I know that, uh, you know, the, hear you talk about that, that process and, and why it was important to redraw and if, if you've discovered through it a way to reread your own work moving forward. The, um, for, for us, redrawing was one way to enter into the book because, as you know, we had been talking about it forever. Um, and every time we tried to sit down and write it, we would just bang our heads against the wall, tear our hair out. And so um, we started to just redraw rather than trying to write. Um, and part of the redrawing was for us to um, discover for ourselves what what um, the, the the formal or material um, kind of um, similarities were. We always knew that we had a consistent approach, but the outcome was always different. And um, often people would react to the work like, well, you know, you do the curvilinear thing for your installations, and then you get all rectilinear on your buildings. And we're like, that's not what it's about at all. Um, and so the redrawing was a way to kind of like find those spaces of continuity. And then through the redrawing, we started to think about the different modes of representation and the way in which, you know, as architects, we have to have different voices um, in terms of the imagery, the drawings, the whatever, right? Like all these different um, graphic voices, right? The voices that are on paper. Um, yeah. And so then we started to play with that. So actually, we're, we're interested in drawing and less so in images. Mm -hmm. And I think the instrumentality of the drawing was interesting to us, uh, its technical capabilities, but also how it could uh, it represent experience. So the drawings show basically come from our, our working drawings, actually. Um, and they've been with us for a long time. I think they kind of emerged in just cert certain pieces emerge in a certain way. Um, but as Mimi was going to say, the book is very heterogeneous because we, uh, we have many voices. And so the drawings are all together. And then you know you have the collages. And it really tells the story in a sort of polyphonic way, um, not about project, but the larger the project that we're, we feel that we're in the trenches working with the whole time. It's also interesting, uh, I, th I think that the, I mean, it was evident uh, in the way that you uh, kind of showed the work, but um, another way to kind of, this rereading happens where it, it seems that you're, you know, I wanted to ask about the role of precedent in your work as well. I know that you certainly uh, kind of use it quite a bit in, you know, studio in the way that you teach, but there's kind of always these set of references and how that, um, you know, comes into play. In, in fact, you know, it, it's still at the diagram level, but, but there's something mm -hmm. more that's starting to appear as well. Well, like in 2008, we introduced the idea of the proto building in our, in our studios, which is kind of a proto almost building. It's the same idea, really, just this idea that rather than thinking about history through precedents that are fixed, we can kind of mine uh, these conditions and uh, reappropriate them in a, in a light uh, way. And so we asked our students to combine elements, make hybrids, and think of systemic ways to then assemble them together. And, and we still teach this way, we still think this way in the office, and, and so we're, we're ravenous when it comes to history, but also we'd like to try not to feel the burden of it. Mm -hmm. if we can. And that's for yeah. us, it's history of architecture and um, history of building types, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, um, because we know that we're not reinventing the wheel. There is a long discourse of whatever, um, um, certain strategies, certain um, architectural languages. We're also interested in the history of the sites that we work with um, because we are trying to um, land our projects in, in some way that um, acknowledges that we're working within a complex you know, system, uh, you know, like layers of history, a complex kind of, you know, set of um, influences, and we're trying to um, add to that in in some way. And so the way that, um, you, you know, the, the way that we sometimes work with architectural precedents in the office is that, you know, we may be looking at uh, an element, 
or the way in which those elements combine, or a system, or a, a material decision, et cetera, et cetera. There's different scales and different things that we pull from the precedents, and basically we're trying not to do that. But we're it's, trying to do something different. <laughs> but it's interesting to me because it seems, I mean, I could expand this notion of precedent from a kind of historical notion to the precedent as found object or found building, because you, you're kind of approaching these, you know, kind of found buildings in the in the kind of the same way, of these layers and this kind of cutting and adding and. Uh, um, uh, but but I also have found just again in the lecture tonight that somehow um, even in the, your work on adaptive reuse, this negotiation between you know precedent or old and your intervention has now become or. Maybe just for one project, you know, for the for the heritage um, center, it almost also feels as though this was a kind of found building on which you kind of acted. I mean, there there, there was something very interesting in terms of that uh, lineage of the of the project. So, I'm also wondering whether um, this uh, kind of uh, almost building is starting to uh, become uh, generative in terms of new projects as well. You know this sort of sense yeah. that it was already there or that's right i mean i mean now designing uh, you know more and more ground up buildings i mean they're buildings so actually the book is called Bu buildings and almost yes, buildings yes, it allows know, us I, to I, collect I, a few buildings yes. in there that are <laughs> but, but uh, this is a sense of adaptive reuse is i think it's a platitude to say that every site you're adaptively reusing but um, I think we're always trying to balance irreverence with some sort of respect for some aspect of the building, and uh, but maybe not tell our clients about the irreverence. I mean, it, uh, <laughs> although the EDC was interested in, in hiring us for the Bush Terminal because they liked the, mm -hmm. uh, our approach to ADO, yeah. which was kind of remixing and and you know it's it's tough to do in every project, but we're trying to find this place to like open you know open things up and not make them so co uh, limited or co you know conclusive. It's also been interesting to look at the trajectory of the practice. Um, I mean, you're, of course, you've done competitions around the world, etc. But you're really quite a local, a kind of New York, New York practice, and uh, it's something that we've noticed here. I mean, through lectures, um, there is a uh, maybe uh, a generational sense, or you know the. The sense that you know practices today are that are striving are actually against uh, all uh, um, sense quite embedded within within the city that they work with. Do you find that to be true, or I mean, I would I would say that um, while I wouldn't sneeze at building the library in Shanghai, um, no, I that think, when I we think, no, that would um, be nothing to sneeze. <laughs> no. But um, I have to say that the, the opening that we um, attended for the um, Equal Rights Heritage Center was the most moving opening that we have ever been to. Because when you build a project for a small town like that, it really, really matters. And all these people showed up. It felt like the whole town showed up. And they're so excited, you know. And, and, it, and they're really, really using it. And it's become this kind of magnet for the community. So um, whereas, you know, the, Hong Kong, the, the tower that we built in Hong Kong um, is a very different relationship to the place and, and to the people. And, you know, that was also a very exciting project, but you don't feel it as viscerally mm -hmm. as you do when you work uh, in an environment that is closer to home. So I know that you're quite busy right now. What's what's on the books that you haven't shown tonight? Um, well, the kiosk that I flipped through. <laughs> oh, that looks really good, actually. <laughs> Partly like because we're not track. sure whether there's going to be four or one. Um, I mean, it was designed as four. Um, the second project we showed, the Jones Beach uh, Energy and Nature Center, that's in CDs. Yeah, that's beautiful. So that that yeah. starts construction later this year. Um, the Bush Terminal starts construction also later this year. Um, we have a new building in Chinatown, a house upstate. Uh, you know, we're working in Buffalo on grain elevators. We're in intervening with them, but none and of them a, are formed park, yet. And the park, um, and, yeah. the Gansford Peninsula. Oh yeah, we won that just, just, just west of um, the Whitney with James Corner. Oh, yeah, a frequent another, collaborator. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of work building. in the office. Um, it takes a while for it to percolate to the point where we can see it and understand it in, in the, within the framework that we, you know, uh, are, are working in. And it, it's it, that's an, a process I think all of you probably experience as well. Um, and what about the relationship? I mean, you've been teaching for 
Ever. Yes. <laughs> so how, how, do you, how do you find whether, I mean, it has that, that kind of feedback loop um, between, I mean, we all, it's, you yeah, know. It's essential. It's, it's not just the teaching, and the, but the, the, you know, being with the students who are just so uh, amazing and imaginative, but also with, with our colleagues, is, this conversation is uh, fundamental to all of us, I think, for, uh, in terms of practice. I mean, th this divide doesn't really exist in that conversation. It, it exists in the sense that Mimi and I are in the office for, uh, for a certain part of the week, but uh, otherwise, I think for us, it's instrumental to thinking about practice. Actually, the drawing project kind of emerged mm -hmm. from our teaching because um, at one point I felt like an imposter because I was coming here and talking about representation and um, really pushing the like active drawing and 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 resisting the renderings and you know creating um, imagery out of drawing, um, but we weren't doing it in the office, and so we brought it into the office. Um, as well as, you know, s a certain aspects of our research that um, we do for teaching, we've brought it back into the office, and then, of course, vice versa, right? Like, what we know as practitioners, et cetera, um, we try to bring in, in appropriate ways into teaching. What sort of environmental consultation goes into planning, like, the in Long Island in terms of the mirrors and the lights? I always think I would get afraid for birds. So. Oh, that's an interesting question. It's a very uh, topical issue. Uh, we're, we're using bird-safe glass. There's a lot of migrating birds. Uh, we're using the deep overhangs to shade the glass. Um, it's not foolproof, but you know we need to bring light into the building. But it's definitely a concern. And for this reason, we're not uh, including a wind turbine as one of the energy exhibits. Um, there's a lot of uh, controversy about those. But there will be offshore wind turbines that the state is building that will be interpreted through other material on, on the site. So yes, I mean, cats kill a lot more birds than glass, but still, it's, uh, it's uh, an issue. It's not a glass tower, should we say. That's a good point. <laughs> but definitely, the, um, the, all the mirrored stuff, um, actually, we, we break it down. Um, there, you know, it's, it's not a big risk. It's not like the shard. Um, you know, it's, it's about surface area, and we you know, do very small. Um, slender towers, but um, actually part of the refraction of the one that I flipped through is to confuse the birds. If you give them a, a, a huge surface, um, that um, that really acts as a mirror and they don't know what the limits. So I'm not saying that's the only reason, but part of the faceting is um, about um, not creating a huge surface area for the sun to reflect and produce glare, but also for the, for the birds. But well, one thing we agree upon as partners is to studiously avoid questions about partnership. <laughs> we, um, we duke it out until only the best idea survives. Yeah. It's, um, which is about editing um, and trying to cut out the excess um, ideas, trying to cut out the fat, the extraneous things, right? Like the, the duking out is a process of constant editing and challenging ourselves but you might turn around and ask the people who are sitting behind you and next to you who are staff, and they can give you a more unbiased answer. Um, but it really is about kind of, you know, cu cutting out the extraneous, whether it's extraneous concepts or extraneous um, architectural moves or material decision, um, and tr trying to do more with less. Um, so that is- It's not always quite clear what that is at the moment, right. at the time, but it's very inefficient. <laughs> yeah, very. The napkin sketch was a better strategy yeah. for architectural <laughs> practice. More lucrative. <laughs> it's been a long day. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And um, I hope to see many of you um, soon again. OK, thanks. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.